I, it's a really great group that we have here today. I'm, I'm excited that you all are here. Um, some good supporters that have been with us for a long time. It's really cool to see you all uh, jumping on here. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, I think what we'll do for this very first uh, social distancing hour that we're hosting with you is more of an update of what Advocates for the West is doing, like some of our more pressing cases. And Laird will give you all a little bit of a background on um, how we are adjusting to things, working remotely, what we're doing, how Advocates for the West is faring. And then um, we'll kind of get into the meat of talking about some of the cases that everybody's working on right now. Um, but again, we're really appreciative of all of you for supporting us and helping us, uh, you know, being our funders, being our backers. It's really great to have you here. So um, thanks a lot. So Laird, if you just want to kind of get us started and then uh, when folks are done with their updates, we'll turn it over to Q&A. And if you all can see down in your bottom panel, there's a Q&A option. Um, so that's where you will submit your questions and then I will field them to the attorneys. So, um, and you know, if you have any, uh, if if you have any trouble or any questions, you just feel free to hand and um, let us know. But anyway, all right, Laird, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. Hi, everybody. You know, we can't see everybody, which I wish we could, but I am really thankful for us all coming together this way and, and for you all joining us. Um, I'm sitting in the backyard of my house. You see a image of a sage grouse in the back, which was a gift from Linwood Lahi and, and others a few years ago. And uh, it's to help me remind one of the major things that, uh, you know, that Advocates for the West works on, that I worked on. I've been working on hard the last few days. I think in a week or two, we'll have a more in-depth session about our sage grouse work. But I just want to quickly say that uh, sage grouse has been one of our defining issues for 15 years or more. And uh, Todd Tusi and I, and now Sarah Stelberg, are one of our younger lawyers who is just really kicking rear end on the sage grouse issues. We have been winning important big cases that affect 50 million acres of the American West of prime sage grouse habitat. We recently, in the last month or so won a decision from the district court here in Idaho that threw out one quarter of the oil and gas leases that the Trump administration, that the BLM under Trump has issued in the uh, onshore oil and gas leases in sage grouse habitats, mostly in Wyoming. The oil and gas industry is throwing a fit about this and we're up on emergency appeals in the court of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals now. There's this interesting thing going on where world oil prices have collapsed and I'm sure a lot of you all have seen this, they actually went negative uh, last week or earlier this week. But with the, the crisis really in, 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 in American oil markets, we're hearing that all kinds of oil producers are gonna shut in their wells and not drill more wells and go out of business. Yet in our court filings, the oil and gas companies claim that our court rulings are depriving them of all this money they would have won and all of their best laid plans. And there's a really, there's a lot of misleading information out there. And I guess that's not surprising in this day and age under the Trump administration. Our job, of course, is to bring science and law into the courtroom, bring truth into the courtroom and, and prevail. And so it's been really uh, a busy time. I mean, literally working seven days a week, even though we're at home, working really hard because the courts, federal courts are still open. They are not holding in-person hearings and trials are canceled, but we do electronic filing. Almost everything we do is over the computer anyway. So we're filing briefs and motions and defending things on appeal and having conference calls and talking with our clients and, and all of that. So it really is sort of not business as usual, but still working really hard. And I want to let our other attorneys on here talk about what they're working on, but they cover the gamut of important public lands, uh, salmon and steelhead, and, uh, uh, and a lot of other wildlife issues that they're gonna get to. And, and part of what I want you to listen to as you hear from them is something that I've been thinking a lot about, which is in this, in this day of the, of the COVID virus and the pandemic, we're all at home. We're in our safe refuges. We have places of safety. We're really lucky in that. And our work is 
working on the American West and on the public lands and the rivers that are so important, what we try to do is we try to create and protect refugia for wildlife and fish without their own refuges, those wildlife and fish, they're not gonna make it in the face of climate change and everything else. And our job is to take the laws that are on the books and try to change the status quo from, from resource extraction and degradation and damming the rivers to finding a, a new future where we don't need all those dams on the rivers that kill the fish. We can have solar power, distributed solar power, and we don't need to go out and get oil and gas out of the ground everywhere and fragment all the habitat because again, we can have abundant solar power. We're working on a lot of different issues to try to get at this vision of protecting refugia in the face of climate change and all the threats. And this is what we do day by day. And I just wanna wrap up by saying Advocates for the West, you know, we're, we're 12 people strong now, nine lawyers working hard, um, our budget is about a million and a half dollars. And of course, we rely on foundation grants and individual donations, but we also rely on attorney fee recoveries. In some cases, when we succeed, when we sue the government and win, they have to pay our fees. And we had a couple of good fee recoveries earlier this year on cases that we started uh, in some cases, in one case, a decade ago. Lori brought in a good fee recovery over a a wolf settlement, and that put a bunch of cash into our bank that allows us, it's, it's brought us about a third of the way of meeting our 2020 budget. So we have some cash reserves to make it through at least the short term. We are seeking borrowing from the government's virus response, the CARES Act, the payroll protection program. We haven't gotten that yet, but we feel like we're in a pretty good place to weather this storm. But the second half of the year is going to be when we need our foundation grants to come in, our individual donors. We really appreciate all those of you who have supported us over the years and will continue supporting us. And so I just wanna say thanks. We're working hard, kicking ass. Gonna, I'd like to take questions, but I think the, the point is we'll turn it over to the other staff and then take questions. So Lori, Lori Rule, our senior attorney who I've worked with for 20 years in, in our Portland office. You wanna say a few, a few things about the work you're doing? Sure. Um, yeah, this is interesting. It's uh, it's great to have so many people listening. It's a little weird to be talking and not be able to see who we're talking to. Um, but it's great that everybody has tuned in. Uh, as Laird mentioned, I'm one of the senior attorneys at Advocates. I've been with Advocates since 2002, I guess. Um, I work in the Portland office along with Lizzie uh, and then another staff attorney, Andrew Missel. And we've been plugging along, uh, working hard on cases um, with a variety of topics in a variety of states. I'll give I'll just a few smattering and then I'll talk a little bit more about one of the cases I'm mostly working on right now. Um, but we have, I've been involved in cases against wildlife services. As, as a lot of you probably know, wildlife services is a agency in the Department of Agriculture that essentially goes out and kills wildlife um, uh, on the behest of pro primarily private ranchers. Um, so they will go out and kill coyotes and wolves that, that predate on young livestock. Uh, that's one of their primary missions, unfortunately. And so we've been taking them on uh, for a number of years now, trying to rein in some of their activities and make sure they do environmental analyses uh, on their activities. And as Laird mentioned, we recently settled a case concerning wildlife services wolf killing activities and um, reached a pretty good settlement. They're, they're going to be doing a new environmental impact statement, uh, but that they don't expect that to be completed for about five years. And so in the meantime, they agreed to some fairly substantial restrictions on their activities in Idaho. Primarily, they won't be killing wolves in wilderness areas, wilderness study areas, the Sawtooth National Recreation Area, uh, as well as parts of the Sawtooth Valley and Wood River Valley in central Idaho. So that's huge. Um, and they also agreed to some other restrictions like not using M44s and, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and things like that. And so that was a very positive settlement that we were able to achieve just a couple of months ago, I think. Um, and we're looking at bringing a new action against wildlife services over their over other activities they're doing in Idaho. Uh, we haven't filed that yet, so I don't want to talk about it too much, but uh, we're still going hard on the wildlife services front. Um, I've also worked closely with our staff attorney, Andrew Missel, on a couple of new cases. We are challenging some livestock grazing in Arizona. 
and we're, um, we have our Willamette Dams litigation uh, against the Army Corps of Engineers for not operating their uh, dams on the, in the upper Willamette River to help salmon and steelhead. Basically, their operations are killing many, many salmon and steelhead that are threatened species. So those are active cases that have involved a lot of work and are uh, chugging along right now. Um, the main thing I'm working on is a new, not necessarily new, but another bighorn sheep case. As a lot of you probably already know, uh, I've been working on bighorn sheep issues for 13 years now, I think it is. Uh, and we've made a lot of progress in Idaho. The main issue um, is the conflicts between domestic sheep and bighorn sheep because the domestic sheep carry pathogens that when transmitted to bighorn sheep cause pneumonia in bighorns and uh, end up causing significant bighorn sheep die-offs. Uh, large populations get decimated from pneumonia. And so we've made significant progress creating a lot of separation between domestic sheep and bighorn sheep in Idaho, closing quite a few domestic sheep allotments to protect the nearby bighorn populations. And now we're trying to make similar inroads in Colorado. Um, and, you know, it's Colorado is ne not necessarily an easy state to litigate in, but we're going to forge ahead and um, we're suing the Forest Service over a decision where they just authorized domestic sheep grazing in an area that's very high risk to bighorn sheep. They did their own analysis. They determined that it was a high risk um, allotment and still they went ahead with the project anyways. Uh, and so we're trying to take them on and, and scale back the domestic sheep grazing. Um, and uh, in the meantime, the BLM in Colorado is also moving ahead with another uh, decision that looks like it's going to be, again, another um, authorization of domestic sheep grazing uh, in a very high risk area to bighorn sheep. And interestingly, in that one, it's going all the way up to uh, David Bernhardt in the Department of Interior. And they're looking uh, to him to, ha to help assist in their decision making. Uh, so I, I imagine based on that, it's going to be a very bad decision. <laughs> so we'll be watching that as well. That's in the Gunnison BLM district. So those are some of the issues that uh, I've been involved in uh, the past month or so, and we'll keep working on uh, for the fu foreseeable future. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Lori. And, uh, you know, this notion of taking on Bernhardt and, and uh, the, the, the notion that the Trump BLM, or I'm sorry, Forest Service in Colorado is disregarding their own science, saying the bighorn sheep are at high risk if they turn out the domestic sheep there, and instead following what industry wants. That, of course, is the theme that we see over and over again. And, and what guides so much of our work right now is fighting back against the Trump administration's policy override of science and law. And of course, they're doing it unlawfully in so many ways, but the initial round of Zinke and Pruitt, the flamethrowers who didn't know how to get much done, now they're being replaced by industry technocrats like Bernhardt at Interior and Wheeler at EPA. So it's a deeper and harder fight. But I think we'd like to turn to Lizzie now, also in our Oregon office, to talk about some of the public lands fighting back against Trump, Trump land management things that, that we've been working on. Absolutely. So I'm going to talk about three different issues um, that are on my plate that all involve Trump administration issuance of these resource management plans or management plans that guide um, the future of management of these vast swaths of the American West. Um, Laird was talking about our work on sage grouse management plans, but those are not the only ones that we're seeing issued. Um, you know, the these management plans for whether they're BLM lands or Forest Service lands, or I'm gonna talk about a um, Park Service land as well, they're such a big deal because they guide oil and gas development, livestock grazing, mineral withdrawals, um, mining, you know, recreation use, wilderness protection for 15, 20, 30 years to come. Um, and so unsurprisingly, the Trump administration is prioritizing getting uh, some of these revisions of these management plans done um, because they are so impactful on a number of issues that are not only key to, to you and, and our clients, but uh, you know, many major industries out there. Uh, these management plans are a major way that the Trump administration is able to implement its energy dominance agenda. 
Um, if you haven't heard the administration talking about that, um, you know, it is a key platform of their public lands management. Um, all hands on deck, um, you know, maximizing resource extraction. Um, so the first issue that I want to talk with you about is something that's hot off the press, and that's a management plan that was issued in Colorado guiding um, about a million acres of um, land in the North Fork Valley uh, near Telluride, um, just south of Grand Junction. And so it's beautiful area, um, lots of incredible recreation areas. There's a lot of organic agriculture. Some of the, um, some of the best vineyards in, in the state are there. And it's a unique area because uh, coal extraction was a huge issue for a long time there. And the Valley has really come together to work on, you know, repairing from that resource extraction past and transitioning to a more sustainable future. Um, and so over the course of the last 10 years, communities, towns, counties came together and they put, they put together this alternative for this management plan revision process that started actually under the Obama administration, um, you know, trying to come up with a way that balanced resource protection along with, um, um, you know, other, other uses of public lands, um, of which are mostly BLM lands in this instance. Um, and the Obama administration came out with a draft in about 2016 that was, wasn't great, um, didn't do everything the community wanted, but um, unsurprisingly, when the Trump administration came into office, they did a complete 180 and decided to, you know, keep and expand the uses of the area with a focus on resource extraction. It's, um, you know, almost the entire land in under the jurisdiction of this field office, the Uncompadre it's called, um, will be open to oil and gas drilling. Um, it's, it's a very bad plan and it was issued just, just recently. And I think it's a, there's some really great articles out there that you can read on this because it highlights what's going on with uh, BLM and the Trump administration in particular. So in this instance, um, the peer, so it's the Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, which is an organization that uncovered documents within the agency that showed the local BLM field office, the state field office in Colorado, which notably is run by a petroleum engineer, not you know, a wildlife biologist or someone close to our hearts, um, you know, they were sort of pressing for this one path forward with the plan and were completely overruled by Bernhardt and the, you know, other political appointees in the DC office who said, you know, we don't care what you think, basically, we need this all, you know, energy dominance agenda for this final alternative that we're going to create at the end of this process that people haven't had an opportunity to weigh in on in the last 10 years. And that's the alternative that they chose over the objections of the state and local offices. Um, and so I think it's just a really good example of how the Trump administration has prioritized this moving of the BLM headquarters from Washington DC to Grand Junction in Colorado, which is just 20 or 30 miles north of where these lands are located in this effort to restore local and state control to our federal lands. And here we have an example of local interests, counties, states, you know, the, the local field office, the state field office coming together, wanting to go with a path forward and getting completely overruled by Washington DC um, in this instance. And so it's, it's a really fascinating example of what we're seeing across the West, but it's, it's hot off the presses and it's, um, it's, it's on our radar. We're working with folks um, associated with the Conservation Lands Foundation. This is part of our work with them. Um, we've been responding to lots of inquiries from their friends network across the American West to deal with these Trump administration rollbacks of these um, resource management plans or RMPs. And so that's just the latest example of um, a really fun issue that we're working on now. So, uh, you know, keep a lookout for, for more to come on that. Um, I'm running out of time, but I just want to briefly mention a couple of other key issues that we're working on that are sort of related to this. We recently filed suit over another Trump administration plan for a very special area in Arizona. So this is the San Pedro National Riparian Conservation Area. And it's this very special place along the border um, that has the last free flowing river in the American Southwest. That's, you know, pretty big deal. But the new Trump administration management plan 
doubles down on livestock grazing and a whole bunch of other terrible uses. So we've teamed up with some of our key long-term partners, Western Watersheds Project and the Center for Biological Diversity and the Sierra Club to challenge that plan. Um, and so that's a really fascinating case. You can go check out our case page to learn more on that. Um, and the last thing I just want to mention, uh, where the Trump administration is getting ready to issue a new management plan for the Point Reyes National Seashore, which is a case that we brought a few years ago to get a new planning process um, to address the longstanding um, problems with ranching at the seashore. It's not just public lands grazing there these massive, beautiful oceanfront estates that the taxpayer, taxpayers own and allow these beef and dairy ranchers to, to live and work there. Um, and there's been some really great press in the last couple weeks about how, um, I think it was about 96% of the public weighed in and said no to ranching at the seashore, um, uh, which the Park Service is considering killing all the native elk there. Um, to to uh, protect the ranchers as part of this management plan. Um, and the management plan is due out soon. And I would not be surprised if it's even worse um, than it otherwise would have been because one of the key ranchers there was front and center at a Trump administration or a Trump signing ceremony for an executive order. So Kevin Lunny, um, he was shaking Trump's hand for a you know, deregulatory executive order. So this is another issue that we're working on. Um, it's, in, it's near the Bay, Marin County, and it clearly has the attention of, of Trump himself. And so uh, that should be coming out in the next month or so. And you can learn more about our historic work on Point Reyes National Seashore on our website. Um, but these are just a few of the many examples of the Trump administration management plans that are causing a lot of problems for our supporters. Um, so, so thanks for your, your support so we can continue helping folks um, fight these nasty plans that will govern our public lands for decades to come. And thanks, Lizzie. And, you know, Lizzie is such a terrific attorney. We first were asked to work on that Point Reyes uh, seashore uh, case about five years ago. And uh, I was very fortunate to be able to ask Lizzie to do all the hard work, and she has done a phenomenal job there. And that's part of what we do at Advocates for the West. We, we help these young lawyers who have passion and smarts and a desire to go in the courtroom and kick ass, and we give them as much, much room as they can take to take the ball and run with it. And uh, Lizzie's done a fabulous job. And the San Pedro National Riparian Conservation Area, I just want to talk about for one second this notion of refugia, the places where the fish and wildlife need to go, and riparian areas, the, the green areas along streams and rivers, those are a tiny fraction of the western landscape, the arid western landscape, yet there were so much of the life is. And we're talking here about southern Arizona, um, a really, really important riparian habitat where co Congress required that it be protected for those riparian values, and now the Trump BLM is opening up the livestock grazing and everything else in violation of congressional direction yet again. So thanks for that work, Lizzie. We'd like to now turn to Brian, one of our other young lawyers, except not, not so young. I mean, you guys are getting up there, but Come Brian on. is also taking the ball and run, running with it. Most of Brian's mission is working on rivers and water and fish, and we've had some great success uh, lately in using new theories to put pressure on the Columbia River dams and the Lower Snake River dams. And Brian, why don't you talk about that work and Sawtooth and whatever else you want to talk about? Yeah, so uh, tonight I was actually going to talk specifically about one case, which is a Clean Water Act enforcement case against a suction dredge miner. I think in a couple of weeks we're having a salmon talk we'll, where I will speak about our temperature TMDL case and maybe some other salmon work that I'm doing. Um, yeah, I'm Brian. I'm a staff attorney in the Boise office. I've been at Advocates for about eight and a half years. And thank you all for joining us tonight. The case I'm going to talk about is Idaho Conservation League versus Shannon Poe. Like I said, it's a Clean Water Act enforcement case. And Shannon Poe is a suction dredge miner who lives in California, but has been coming to Idaho uh, to suction dredge mine on the South Fork of the Clearwater River, a beautiful river up in North Central Idaho that's been recovering from years of logging and mining history, uh, but unfortunately has been overrun with suction dredge miners in recent years. Before I explain exactly what suction dredge mining is, 
just a little bit about Clean Water Act enforcement, which is an important, important part of our work. Uh, as many of you probably know, the Clean Water Act is our federal law that uh, keeps our waters clean. And the main way it does that is by requiring a permit if you're going to discharge pollution into a river or a lake or the ocean. And uh, fortunately, the Clean Water Act has what's called a citizen suit provision that allows individual people, conservation groups, uh, to enforce that law. Is that a cat? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, most laws we can't just go out and enforce. That's a job for, for the police or for the government. If I see somebody speeding down my street right now, I can't issue them a citation. The Idaho Conservation League can't issue them a citation. But fortunately, Congress put these citizen suits into some of our environmental laws, recognizing that there would probably be instances where for political or uh, lack of resource reasons, the federal and state government wouldn't follow through and wouldn't enforce environmental laws. So we do a lot of Clean Water Act enforcement cases, and this is one example of that. Um, just to explain what suction dredge mining is, since people might not know that, I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen here and show a couple pictures of a suction dredge. It's pretty interesting. So this photo, which I hope you all can see, this is Mr. Poe's suction dredge. This is on the South Fork of the Clearwater River. You can see his dredge camp where he hangs out on the riverbank there. And the dredge is a floating watercraft. It's tethered to the shore, so it stays in one place in the river. And you'll see that long hose going down into a deep dredge pit that, uh, that was dredged. This is from 2018 when Mr. Poe was up there around the day that we filed our lawsuit. Uh, you fire up the dredge by turning on those two engines. You wear equipment that's pretty similar to scuba diving equipment and go down to where there's a nozzle at the end of the long hose and suck up riverbed material, uh, rock, sand, gravel, insects, uh, plants that might be growing in there. Everything gets sucked up the dredge, uh, onto the dredge through that long hose. And then it runs across the top of the dredge where it goes through a sluice box and any gold uh, and other heavy substances settle out and the rest gets shot back into the river. I'll share another photo that shows the dredge when it's actually operating. So this is a photo uh, of Mr. Poe's dredge operating and you'll see that there is a sort of turbid plume of sediment that's coming out the back after he shoots all the rock and sand and gravel back into the water. And yeah, so, so how did this case come about? Um, around 10 years ago or so, some states started cracking down on suction dredge mining because they realized it was having really severe impacts to streams and water quality and fisheries. So California, for example, banned suction dredge mining. The state of Oregon put a moratorium on suction dredge mining. And so through those and other similar efforts by states, a lot of suction dredge miners started coming to Idaho and other places that didn't have those same restrictions in place. Idaho Conservation League got concerned as they were seeing more and more suction dredge miners, particularly on certain rivers like the Salmon River and the South Fork of the Clearwater. Um, Shannon Poe, the defendant in our case, is the president of a nonprofit called the American Mining Rights Association. And he's become a real rabble rouser and is encouraging people to come dredge in Idaho and not follow the law. He's willing to get his state of Idaho permit that you need, which is really pretty simple to get. It's more like getting a fishing license, but he's unwilling to follow any federal laws that the Forest Service and other agencies require and he's very vocal about not wanting to follow the Clean Water Act and not get a pollution discharge permit. And so when he showed up in 2014 and made a big scene, Idaho Conservation League decided that in future years they'd watch for him coming back and monitor other suction dredge miners. And after Mr. Poe came back again in 2015, we uh, sent him a notice of intent to sue. He then took a couple years off, but came back in 2018 and that's when we decided to file our lawsuit in August 2018 while Mr. Poe was up there dredging on the South Fork. Uh, since that time, in 2019, most of our work was defending a motion to dismiss that Shannon Poe filed. 
we prevailed on that, and so the case is moving forward. And where we are now is that we're in the liability stage of the case where we are proving to the court that he was up there dredging, he didn't have a permit, and trying to establish exactly how many days he was up there dredging. After this stage of the case, we'll move into remedies. The court can prohibit him from dredging unless he gets a permit and can also impose civil penalties, which are a big deterrent on polluters and something we use to make sure people follow the law. So right now in this liability stage of the case, uh, Poe's not contesting that he was up there dredging. He admits that, and we have lots of videos and things of him up there dredging. And he admits he doesn't have a permit, but he has some legal theories that this shouldn't be regulated by the Clean Water Act. He claims that when he's shooting sediment and stuff back into the river, it's not a pollution discharge because those are materials that were already in the river, which is kind of a cute argument, but it's not a great argument. Uh, while those materials were at the bottom of the river, they weren't actually in the water column and weren't having water quality impacts. Whereas he's digging these deep pits and resuspending all these different materials and causing the big pollution discharge plume that you saw in that second photo. Uh, he also has an argument that, well, if he has to get some kind of permit, it's not this pollution discharge permit, it's a different kind of Clean Water Act permit that has to do with dredge and fill materials. And it's another interesting argument, um, and we'll be briefing that uh, over the summer. Uh, hey, thanks, Brian. So that is a really good detailed look at how we do some of our environmental enforcement under the Clean Water Act. We have a lot of experience in that, and one of the things Brian and I have worked on the last few years is a similar Clean Water Act case against the Atlanta gold mine, which some of you may remember, but beginning about 15 years ago, they were going to put an open pit cyanide heap, heap leach mine at Atlanta, Idaho, and we got involved with Idaho Conservation League, and we brought several rounds of Clean Water Act litigation, and we stopped that mine, and we got the largest, I believe, citizen penalty against a mine under the Clean Water Act, $2.5 million. And the mining company, which is from Canada, like so many are, has apparently folded up its shop and gone away. It's very hard to stop mines that are on public lands under the 1872 Mining Act, but we've done it with the Atlanta mine. And now another thing that uh, Brian and I and Amanda Rogers, who's one of our new staff attorneys as well, is we're fighting the Stibnite mine, which is a new proposed gold mine at the Stibnite site on the East Fork of the South Fork of the Salmon River, the South Fork of the Salmon being one of the primary uh, habitats for salmon and steelhead in Idaho. And the Stibnite site heavily degraded from past mining, but the Midas Gold Corporation wants to put in a new mine there to mine for 20 or 30 years. They claim they're going to improve the area, but they ignore the long-term impacts they're gonna have with valley fills, huge tailings ponds in perpetuity, putting rivers into pipes and long-term adverse impact on fisheries. So these are the kinds of work we're doing on the Clean Water Act. And then one other case, I know Brian, you're gonna talk about it a week or two, but I just have to mention that we have been using the Clean Water Act in an innovative way going after high temperatures in the Columbia and Lower Snake Rivers caused by the dams, the main stem dams. The Clean Water Act regulates pollutants into a river and temperature is one, and dams are a cause of this. So Brian has recently won uh, well, we have together not only a district court opinion upholding the Clean Water Act against EPA, but the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. And just in the last couple of weeks, they declined to rehear the case. EPA has decided not to go to the Supreme Court, and they're going to issue a new, a new plan for, for addressing temperature in the river soon. Under Trump administration, EPA, it may not be great. We'll probably continue to litigate, but that's sort of the way it goes. So I'm going to stop there. Anna, are you going to come in now? Yep, I was just going to cut in here. Um, yeah, we're getting some good questions coming in, so I'd like to uh, get those going. For those of you who joined a little later, I am the voice behind our little symbol there in the uh, corner. Uh, so our first question that we received is, and I don't see who this is from, unfortunately, because everyone is Anna Dimitriades today, um, which we will fix next time. Uh, Will the Supreme Court ruling that polluted water that flows underground into nearby lakes, rivers, and bays uh, is, oh, let's see, is covered by the Clean Water Act impact any current or future cases? Yes. Uh, okay, go ahead, Larry. I'll jump in. Yes, so the County of Maui case came down yesterday, the day before, and 
we dodged a bullet. The Supreme Court is not a place environmentalists usually want to be. But fortunately, in this in this case, uh, a couple of the more conservative justices joined the liberal ones and held that the Clean Water Act applies. Normally, it applies when you discharge water, like out of a pipe, into a river, a stream, or a navigable water. But what if you stop short? What if you put it into the groundwater? In the, in the Maui case, it was sewage discharge going in close to the ocean, would travel quickly to the ocean, but they claimed they didn't put it in there. Anyway, yes, they upheld, in general, the longtime court holdings that if it's directly connected to uh, surface water, you have to get a permit. That is really applicable to this Stibnite mine case that I just mentioned, uh, where we have a number, and, and it would be applicable as well, possibly to our Atlantic Gold case, because you have a, we have a number of places where mines or others discharge waters in ways that may go to the groundwater, may be close to surface water, may go through a marsh or a wetland, and so it will help preserve our ability to enforce, to enforce the Clean Water Act going forward. Great, thanks Laird. Um, and just so all of our uh, participants know, you can submit your questions uh, using the Q&A uh, icon in the lower bar there. So go ahead and send some questions if you have any. And uh, I have one here in the chat from David Clopton. Thanks David. Uh, to all panelists, uh, two questions. One, are you seeing changes in the courts resulting from the many Trump appointed judges? And two, if we were to see a change in the White House next year, could some of the drastic policy changes be undone? Who wants to tackle that one? Nobody wants to go for that. <laughs> Lizzie? Sorry, right, no, I was on mute uh, and I started talking. I've been doing this so much, I should know better. Uh, yeah, I will talk about the second one because I think it's actually relevant to the three management plan examples that um, I was talking about. Uh, I mean, yes, surely there will be, if we get a new administration, I mean, hopefully we will see some real drastic changes in overarching national policy. Um, you know, I would hope in particular that we'd see a big swing in that energy dominance agenda. You know, I don't know if how long primary promises wind up uh, sticking around, but I was pretty shocked during the primary um, contest that, um, you know, so many folks, and I think Biden included, um, you know, were supportive of no more oil and gas leasing on, on federal lands or new oil and gas leasing, something like that. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, surely we'll see some changes in that, but I think relevant to what Advocates for the West does, um, I think a lot of the changes will be more modest. I think all three of the management plan examples that I discussed, have, those are situations where the Trump administration has taken things to new arbitrary levels, um, you know, really, really bad decisions. But the truth is that even under the Obama administration, um, the things that the agency was, you know, looking to do or had been doing for a long time was not consistent with a lot of the values that we seek to enforce, um, you know, in the federal court. So I think Larry talked about, um, you know, not just complying with the law, but, you know, ensuring that our agencies are making decisions based upon sound science. Um, and so I think I mentioned that the draft on Compadre RMP uh, that came out in 2016 was still very oil and gas focused. Um, you know, it was still disregarding a lot of the interests um, in that the local community wanted to see in a lot of our longstanding clients. And so, um, you know, same thing with the Point Reyes and the San Pedro uh, examples. Both of the agencies in those situations were allowing very harmful livestock raising to go on for, for decades, even though it wasn't um, you know, hasn't really been supported by the law and the science. Um, and so I think, you know, surely we'll see big drastic changes if we get a new administration with some of those big things, but I don't personally expect the administration to be changing some of those longstanding, um, you know, policies. I think the agencies are in um, with some of these specific areas. I think the agencies, um, you know, I mean, long before the Trump administration came in, uh, you know, Advocates for the West was, you know, fighting bad decisions and bad management plans and bad policies, you know, from, from both political administrations. And so, um, you know, surely a lot of those will continue, or, you know, that work um, will need to continue. And I think, uh, you know, one, one thing 
another thing to think about is it is going to take us a long time to undo the damage from these Trump administration plans. I mean, you know, some of them are easy to, to challenge and, and get thrown out in court because they are so arbitrary. It's actually a little more fun fighting the Trump administration because some of the decisions are so bad. It makes our job a little bit easier. Um, but the truth is we can't fight everything. And so there are a lot of things that, um, you know, are still going to take a ton of work to get thrown out. And, you know, often our legal challenges, we have these big overarching theories, but we have you know, our, our legal claims are somewhat narrow and, you know, sometimes it can be tough to really address all the harm that comes from a single decision. And so, um, you know, I think maybe just to sort of sum up some of my thoughts, I mean, yes, we hope to see big drastic changes with some of these overarching policies, um, but the damage from some of these Trump administration decisions is going to be long lasting and take us a long time to fight um, um, and, you know, it's going to take a lot of political work uh, from our allies to, to make that change, um, you know, implemented on the ground. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, I don't expect a, a Biden uh, administration in particular to be, um, you know, really addressing a lot of the longstanding concerns that um, advocates for the West and our clients have um, about many of these uses of our public lands and rivers. And, uh, you know, I see that one of the questions on the table is the Lower Snake River dams. And so I think, yeah, that's just another example of, um, you know, actions that have been allowed to happen for a long time under administrations from, um, you know, both sides of the political spectrum. Thanks, Lizzie. Um, yeah, so we're getting some good questions in here. I see two about uh, TMDL and the Lower Snake River dams. I just wanna uh, flag for you all that we are going to do this as a series. Um, it seems like this is going pretty well. So uh, next Friday, we intend to talk about sage grouse and uh, oil and gas leases. And that will be a really interesting conversation. And the one after that will be about uh, TMDL and uh, Lower Snake River dams in particular, but um, I I kind of leave it up to panelists. Do you want to tackle that what, any of these questions now, or should we move on to some of the others here? Ask the questions. Let's okay. get the questions out. So I'm going to kind of combine these first two. Uh, so there's a question about who is uh, lead on the. Uh, on our um, TMDL case, which is Brian Hurlbutt. And so this question here says, uh, oh, I'm gonna go to the summary here. Um, Do you think the new TMDL will have any impact on the EIS addressing the future operation of the federal dams on the same rivers? Yeah, good question. So that's been one, um, kind of issue with the temperature TMDL case is thinking about how even if we do get the temperature TMDL, which would be EPA's pollution plan for fixing temperature problems on the Columbia Lower Snake Rivers. Yeah, sorry, Brian, just to interrupt, can you uh, define what TMDL is for those who may not know? Yeah, so it's a, it's a total maximum daily load. So every state has to look at every river segment and lake and stretch of coast and figure out whether it's meeting pollution standards. And if it's not, the state, or in some cases EPA, has to come up with a total maximum daily load, which is the amount of pollution that can be allowed to go into that water body, but to make sure it doesn't exceed the standards for water quality. So there's too much hot temperature on the Columbia and Lower Snake Rivers. It's pretty much all caused by the dams, the main stem dams on those rivers. And this temperature uh, pollution plan, or TMDL, that EPA is going to be releasing in May, should be identifying at each dam, here's how much temperature increase that dam is causing by slowing down the water and creating a wide reservoir that bakes in the sun all summer. And in order to get the water cool enough to support our fish, here's what kind of temperature reduction is needed at each dam. We hope that uh, some of the science behind the temperature TMDL that EPA has already finished a while ago will help inform the environmental impact statement that other agencies are doing right now over the ongoing operation of all the dams in the Columbia and Lower Snake. Uh, we also hope that the temperature TMDL itself when it comes out may help inform that. 
Um, I haven't been super plugged into that process, and so I'm not sure um, exactly uh, what how the temperature issues are being addressed in the EIS. But we hope that the underlying science that EPA has come up with will help, you know, show what's really going on uh, with temperature with respect to the dams, and that agencies like the Army Corps and Bureau of Rec can't just kind of sweep that under the rug. Uh, so hopefully it helps in that way. And then outside of the EIS, we're hoping that the temperature TMDL will lead to real on the ground changes through uh, pollution permitting. One of our clients on the temperature TMDL case is Columbia Riverkeeper. And for years, they've been strategically working to get Clean Water Act pollution permits for each of these dams and uh, have been working to make sure that if and when that finally does happen, that the dams will have to meet the temperature reduction limits that are set in the TMDL. So it's, it's going to take a while to kind of play out and see, but that's, that's what we're hoping for. Thanks, Brian. Um, there's another question here for you from Grant Barber saying, regarding the case against Mr. Poe, if successful, could attorney's fees be awarded? Yes, the Clean Water Act has a fee provision that allows for costs and fees to be recovered if we prevail. Uh, will we be able to collect against Mr. Poe? Hopefully, maybe. Uh, the Atlanta Gold case that Laird mentioned, we have an outstanding attorney fee claim right now, and it appears that the company is you know, teetering on the verge of bankruptcy and we might never see our fees. Um, but yeah, theoretically, we would be able to recover our fees in the end if we prevail. All right, thanks Grant, thanks for the question. Um, okay, moving on, this one is, uh, Advocates for the West has enjoyed and earned phenomenal success over the past several years, both in the courtroom and with longstanding environmental impact on the ground. Given the current state of the US economy and uncertainty of a near-term recovery, what steps does AFW plan to take to continue receiving the current level of financial support from donors? Laird, do you wanna take that one? Um, when I first started doing this back in 1993, I was brought to Idaho by a group of local lawyers and others who wanted a permanent lawyer fighting for the environment here. And Jeff Faraday, a local Boise lawyer, was part of that hiring. And I'm like, Jeff, I've never raised money. How do I do it? And he said, Laird, do good work and the money will follow. And that's what I've been doing since 1993. And for a long time, a few years, it was with the Land and Waterfront of the Rockies, and then it was with Advocates for the West. And since 2003, Advocates has grown from a budget of about 300,000 to, like I said before, about 1.5 million now. We're bringing in these younger lawyers. Our job, my job, is to help foster young lawyers and turn them into senior lawyers who kick ass for the environment. We, like every place, we have young lawyers that come and go, but a lot of them are out working with our clients or other organizations now. We have a lot of uh, young law students who come through and move on. And, and the folks we have here sitting here and the rest of our staff, you know, my job is to sustain our income flows to be able to support them. And we do it in partnership with the foundations and the individuals that value our work and support us. And I don't think that's gonna change. And I think people realize that these are dark days and they're challenging days. And one of the values that we bring, Advocates for the West brings is smart lawyers that are flexible, that look for ways to win. And so there's opportunities out here. And I think that as we show show that we can exploit those opportunities, take advantage of them, win on the ground. People will wanna keep supporting us. We do need those nonprofit dollars. We are a nonprofit organization. We need foundation grants and individual donations. And we've been fortunate to have a lot of good, strong partners. And some of you are on the phone right now or on this call right now. And uh, we really appreciate it and we'll, we'll keep it going. So I don't know if that answers the question, but thanks for, thanks for all your help. Yeah, I think that was great, Laird. And I do want to just add real quickly, too, that we have seen some really nice uh, donations come in uh, through Idaho Gives, which we just launched yesterday. It's um, typically a one-day fundraiser every year in Idaho, but this year it's a two-week fundraiser to help nonprofits get a leg up during uh, this kind of uncertain time. 
And um, it's been really hard. You can see the generosity of folks who are um, who really believe in our work. And some of you are on the call today, and I, I just want to say thanks. And um, you know, we're we're finding new and innovative ways to reach out to people. And um, it's it's been a, an experience for all of us. But really, really appreciate the support that we're seeing. Um, so thanks for that question. So next question is from Paul Hill says, uh, want to first say congrats on your string of recent victories and particularly the settlement on the wildlife services case and the decision to require CRSO agencies to demonstrate their operations will meet the temperature requirements in the river in Idaho. Second, the briefs by your attorneys today are very helpful. Do you think the crash in the oil markets will effectively drive some of the smaller and more problematic producers to close up shop? Seems like the crash is a harbinger of things to come, which we hope is good news. I'm going to jump on that one because I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. And you bet, Paul, I think the crash in oil prices, as we all know, it's a, it's a game changer. Like, who, who would have thought 10 years ago this would happen? I was a peak oil believer, and I confidently predicted oil would be $200 a barrel for the rest of history, if, if not higher. And now it's at $10 a barrel, negative earlier. And I'm from Oklahoma, and I come from the oil patch, and I have family and friends in the oil patch, and they're hurting, and things are shutting down. And out in Wyoming, out in the West, it is, I think it's going to be a big game changer. So I'm, last night I sent a detailed uh, email to uh, one of our good friends who, uh, is plugged in in many different circles because there are opportunities to think about retiring oil and gas leases on federal lands, finding ways to do debt for nature swaps, forgiving, uh, forgiving debts in return for giving up leases. And how could that be done? Where would the funding come from? I don't know, but I know that we're putting a lot of pressure on the operators. We're throwing into question their leases. We're throwing into question their ability to do this in the long term. And now with the economic things, that is a double whammy. So I, I sense opportunity here. I'm really not sure how we can benefit from it, but I think other people are starting to talk about it. And so where are the pools of money that could fund oil and gas lease retirement? That's an interesting thing to think about. I'll throw that back out to everybody. All right, thanks, Laird. Um, we don't have any other questions except one comment from Lisa Rutherford. Thanks, Lisa, I'm gonna read this out here. Uh, it says, no specific question, just want to say how much I appreciate everything AFW is doing for our organization, Conserve Southwest Utah and others. We are faced with two big issues here, the Lake Powell Pipeline and the Northern Corridor Highway through the Red Cliffs National Conservation Area. AFW has been great at helping us with the NC Highway, so very appreciated. Um, so thanks, Lisa. And if we had Todd on, he could talk a little bit more about that too, but um, we should definitely slate that for a future conversation and maybe even have you join in with us next time. Um, if there aren't any other questions, uh, I'm not sure if anybody else wants to kind of do any last minute submissions. Otherwise, we're right at about six o'clock. So um, I'm gonna hop back on here. Um, hi, I'm back. So uh, I really appreciate you guys coming in. Um, it's really nice to, to have this uh, kind of discussion. And I think this is, uh, this is, like I said, our first time doing it. So it's kind of interesting to see how it all goes. It seems like it went really well. Um, I invite all of you who came on the call today to submit um, feedback to me via email. I'd love to hear from you and know what you think we can improve. Or if you just want to show your appreciation, I'd love to hear from you all. Um, I, we definitely want to do this again. Um, so you could suggest topics that you may really want to hear about or um, anything else that may be kind of a burning question for you. Um, but we'll definitely plan to do this next Friday um, for, uh, I think we have, yeah, like I said, sage grouse. And then the Friday after that for um, sort of salmon river work or, and salmon. Um, anyway, I thanks again very much, you guys, for being on the call. Laird, I don't know if you want to say anything else, um, but I'm going to go ahead and say we'll wrap things up here. No, thanks, everybody. It was fun. Uh, happy Friday. Yeah, happy Friday, everyone. Uh, I'll look forward to your emails, hopefully, and um, look forward to seeing you on another call soon. All right. Take care. Bye, guys. Happy weekend. Bye.
Bye. Thanks.